Welcome back. As I promised, uh, every minute that we delay is a minute taken away from uh, our distinguished guest. I promised uh, John Mearsheimer that I wouldn't give a, a long introduction. If, if, you, if, you, if you're here, you know John Mearsheimer, likely. I won't read his bio. Uh, maybe you know him from such great hits like Why Leaders Lie, or The Tragedy of Great Power Politics, or The Israel Lobby, or Conventional Deterrence, one of his first books. Maybe you're a you know, big King's College fan, or a British uh, historian, and you, and you like B.H. Liddell Hart, my personal favorite book, not one of his favorites, apparently. Uh, the Weight of History, it's the single greatest takedown of um, someone who probably deserved to be taken down uh, a notch or two um, based on their own claims. But back to John, John Mearsheimer, again, professor at University of Chicago. Um, the only thing I want to highlight, uh, you may know him for all those other things, but early in his career, he actually uh, was quite involved in the world, the nuclear realm, in a couple different ways. First of all, there was a book in the mid-80s, uh, early 80s, on uh, the ethics of nuclear deterrence, of which John co-edited, which I don't think he even appears on his CV anymore. He tried to take it off, but he once thought deeply about those issues of ethics uh, and, and nuclear deterrence. He probably still does. Um, the other thing is that uh, John Mearsheimer is a, a 1970, a class of 1970 graduate from uh, the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. And I want, you know, usually when you say someone's a distinguished graduate of, of West Point, you, you say what rank they were in the in that class. I'm not going to get into that. Let's just say it was somewhere between, between you know, General Robert E. Lee and Edgar Allan Poe to, to <laughs> West, somewhere in between there was his uh, accomplishments. But right after, um, he was, a, a, of course, military academy, but went in to be an Air Force officer at the time. I can't quite recall why um, there was that, the ability to do that, but he went into R&D, uh, working on space and missile policy um, out in Los Angeles for the, for the Defense Department. And I gather he was working on nuclear-related issues at the height of the you know, 19, early 1970s of the Cold War. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming John Mearsheimer. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Keir. Uh, it was actually due to Kim Il-sung, uh, really, that uh, I ended up in the Air Force. Uh, but I won't tell you that story now. Uh, I also graduated in the bottom one-third of my class at West Point, as I like to tell people. And I was not even the top man in the bottom one-third. <laughs> How I ended up here speaking today before you, I have no idea. So I often joke to people, I sometimes wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat saying to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> but anyway, I'm here. Uh, the unipolar moment is behind us, uh, and we're now moving into a multipolar world where great power politics is back on the table. Uh, and as a result of this, the whole subject of nuclear strategy uh, and the possibility of a nuclear arms race is back on the table. It's very interesting, but for the older people in the audience who grew up in the Cold War like I did, subjects like nuclear strategy were paid an enormous amount of attention. Uh, we just spent endless hours debating these issues. Uh, and then the Cold War ended and we moved to the unipolar moment. And that subject almost disappeared completely. Uh, and what came in its place for people who did nuclear issues was the causes of nuclear proliferation. So I like to think that back in the bipolar world, we studied strategy and did not pay that much attention to the causes of nuclear proliferation. But then with the coming of unipolarity, where there's just one great power in the system, and great power nuclear strategy by definition doesn't matter that much, and proliferation really does matter to the United States, during the unipolar moment, we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about the causes of proliferation. Well, now we're transitioning from unipolarity to multipolarity. Great power politics is back on the table. And I would imagine we'll still pay attention to the causes of nuclear proliferation. But at the same time, I think what's going to happen here is you're going to see an enormous amount of interest in the subject of nuclear strategy and the subject of nuclear arms racing. And really what I want to talk about today is the subject of arms racing. And my title for the talk is The Great Powers and the Quest for Nuclear Advantage. Now with regard to arms racing, uh, there are a good number of foreign policy experts who believe that arms racing, 
for great powers is foolish behavior. Uh, most of these people uh, are associated with the nuclear revolution. Uh, these are folks who believe it makes no sense to arms race to try to gain nuclear advantage because nobody's going to fight a nuclear war anyway. Uh, nuclear weapons are so horrible. The consequences of them are, are so devastating. Uh, and we have so little understanding of escalation at the nuclear level that no one would be uh, foolish enough uh, to start or initiate nuclear use. Then you have a lot of arms controllers uh, who believe that it's downright dangerous to engage in nuclear arms racing. Uh, people who believe in the nuclear revolution effectively don't believe it's dangerous because the things are just not going to be used. But arms controllers tend to believe that arms races are really bad because it increases the likelihood uh, that nuclear weapons will be used. And given the horrific consequences of a nuclear war of almost any sort, we therefore should go to great lengths to prevent nuclear arms racing for the purpose of preventing nuclear war. What I want to do today is I want to talk about what the future holds for nuclear arms racing. And I want to ask three specific questions. First, should we expect the great powers to arms race for strategic nuclear advantage? Second, is it strategically wise for them to do so? Is it strategically smart for the great powers to try to seek advantage over their adversaries? Or is this just an example of states behaving in non-strategic or irrational behavior? <clears throat> then the third question I want to ask is, does arms racing for gain increase the likelihood of nuclear war? In other words, if we do see arms racing, does it increase the likelihood of war? Here are my three answers before I go into detail. First. The great powers are going to engage in nuclear arms racing, just as the Soviets and the Americans did during the Cold War. Great powers, in my opinion, almost always look to gain military advantage over rival great powers, whether it's at the conventional level or at the nuclear level. At the nuclear level, great powers do not like living in a mad world. And when they find themselves in a mad world, they do everything they can to transcend it or to gain advantage despite it. My second argument is, although many arms controllers and nuclear revolutionists think that this kind of behavior is irrational, it is not. Indeed, it makes good strategic sense to arms race for advantage, and it certainly makes good strategic sense not to let your adversary gain a nuclear advantage over you. Third, while seeking nuclear advantage makes sense from the perspective of each individual great power, there's little doubt that it makes nuclear war more likely, which is not to say it makes it likely but it clearly makes nuclear war more likely. The possibility of nuclear use would be close to zero if every country had nothing more than an assured destruction capability, which is, of course, the capability to destroy the other side as a functioning society. But that's not the world we live in, and it's not the world we will ever live in. Now, how am I going to make my case? First, I want to explain to you why great powers seek nuclear advantage. And basically what I'm going to try and do is tell you what the good reasons are for trying to seek nuclear advantage. Then I'm going to attempt to explain what nuclear advantage looks like, because it's very important to give you some sense of how I think states can actually gain a nuclear advantage, which means they can use nuclear weapons in ways that benefit them and don't end up getting them incinerated. Uh, <clears throat> then what I want to do is give you a synoptic version of Cold War and post-Cold War history to show that if you look at the great powers, two great powers in the Cold War and the single great power in the post-Cold War world, you'll see 
that they constantly worked to gain nuclear advantage. Then I want to deal with the two major counter arguments against me, and then finally conclude with a few words about arms control and how far arms control can go to slow down an arms race. OK, so let me give you my reasons why I think great powers seek nuclear advantage. And again, what I'm trying to do here is to tell you that it makes strategic sense. First, great powers sometimes have foreign policies that explicitly call for having a first use strategy, which of course means initiating the use of nuclear weapons for either coercive or for purposes of defeating an adversary. And any country that has a first use policy is going to want to have an advantage over its rivals. It, it kind of just goes with the territory. Now, let's talk about the United States. The United States, as was clear from much of the discussion this morning, has long had a first use policy. And there is no evidence that we're giving up that first use policy. That first use policy is inextricably tied to extended deterrence. During the Cold War, the United States took it upon itself to put its nuclear umbrella over Germany, mainly in Central Europe, and over Korea, South Korea, and Japan in East Asia. We didn't want them to have nuclear weapons. We did not, for good strategic reasons, want them to have a trigger on a nuclear, uh, a finger on a nuclear trigger, so we extended deterrence to them. That meant we had to be willing <coughs> to use nuclear weapons to come to their rescue in case their survival was threatened. Uh, that involved a first use policy. And one, again, once you have a first use policy, you better think about nuclear advantage, because you may have to use those weapons first. And of course, this situation is not going to change in the emerging multipolar war world, because we are going to extend deterrence to both South Korea and Japan uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, so I would say to you, given that the United States is tied to a first use policy and that we're surely going to seek nuclear advantage in the future, you can rest assured we're going to arms race with all the other great powers in the system. And in this multipolar world, that means China and Russia. Second reason it makes sense to uh, arms race for advantage is even if you don't have an explicit or immediate need for a first strike capability, you want to have that capability in reserve, because a rainy day may come along, and you may need to think about initiating nuclear use. Uh, and when that's the case, you want to make sure you have maximum military advantage. Uh, let me give you an example. If a great power is involved in a conventional war with a rival great power, and it comes to believe that its territorial integrity or its survival is being threatened, I think there's a good chance that that great power is going to want to think about initiating nuclear use to rescue itself. Almost everybody agrees that great powers are likely to use nuclear weapons when they feel their survival is threatened. And great powers are remarkably sensitive about attacks on their homeland and attacks uh, on allies that live close to them. And you can imagine situations where a great power may want to rescue a situation uh, by initiating nuclear use. Then there's always the possibility, if you see a rival great power beginning to mobilize its nuclear forces, and that great power has vulnerable nuclear forces, and you know that great power is in a use them or lose them situation, you want to take out that arsenal as quick as you can. I'll talk more about this later, but this is the great danger that China runs. It has a quite vulnerable nuclear arsenal, gets into a crisis with the United States. The United States thinks it has a first strike capability, have very powerful incentives here in Washington to take out those Chinese nuclear forces before they can be used. Is this likely to happen? No. I'm just saying it's a serious possibility. And if you're the United States of America, you want to have the capability, should that event arise, and should you feel compelled to do it. Uh, furthermore, one can imagine plausible scenarios where a great power has incentives 
to launch a nuclear strike against a nuclear armed minor power that's acting in threatening ways. And the prospect of having a disarming first strike capability against a minor power is much greater than it is against a great power because a great power usually has a survival or retaliatory force. Not always, but usually. Uh, whereas when you're dealing with minor powers, you're dealing with countries like North Korea or Iran, if it were to get nuclear weapons, uh, you're in the realm of possible first strike scenarios. Um, third reason that you seek nuclear advantage uh, is because of the possibility that an adversary will use nuclear weapons against you or against an ally. And if that's the case and you have to retaliate, first of all, you want to make sure that the initiator, your adversary, doesn't gain an advantage over you. So you have to check the initiator. But furthermore, if you do get into a nuclear conflict, what you want to do is do everything possible to make sure you have a nuclear advantage so that you can settle that conflict on terms that are favorable to you. Again, I'm not saying that you can achieve that, but you can rest assured that great powers will go to great lengths to make sure uh, they maximize their chances of achieving that capability. And then the final reason that you're going to want to have nuclear advantage uh, is there's always a possibility that a close ally will initiate nuclear use and drag you into a nuclear war. Uh, one of the reasons we pay so much attention to extended deterrence is because we don't want allies to have their fingers on the trigger because we don't want an ally to start a nuclear war when it feels its survival is at stake and then drag us into that nuclear war. But that could happen. Not too likely now because extended deterrence works, but you hypothesize a situation where South Korea and Japan both have nuclear weapons and a war breaks out between one of those countries or both of those countries and China, it is possible nuclear weapons could be used. And if the Chinese mainland gets hit with nuclear weapons by the South Koreans or the Japanese, the Chinese might very well strike back at the United States as well as South Korea and Japan. Again, this is why we like extended deterrence. But for those sorts of scenarios, you want to make sure that you have a nuclear advantage. Because if you get involved in a nuclear war, you don't want uh, to be at a disadvantage. Let me conclude my discussion with just one point. Uh, I'm not arguing that nuclear arms racing guarantees that a great power will gain an advantage over its opponents. It's not my argument. My key point is that great powers constantly try to gain nuclear advantage over their rivals, and they do it because they're powerful incentives to do so. OK, let me switch gears now and talk about the meaning of nuclear advantage. I've said to you up to now that great powers go to great lengths to achieve nuclear advantage. But what exactly is nuclear advantage? And what this really is all about is the question of how you can employ nuclear weapons in a way that gives you an advantage. And my argument is that a great power pursuing nuclear advantage can achieve it in four different ways at least theoretically. And let me tell you what those four different ways are. The ideal outcome is to be the only state in the system that has nuclear weapons. Then there's no possibility of retaliation. You're the only state that has nuclear weapons. And you can easily begin to contemplate situations where you would use nuclear weapons, because you have a great advantage. You are the only power with nuclear weapons. Uh, however desirable this situation is, no state is going to achieve nuclear monopoly in our lifetime. The best outcome a great power can hope for in the contemporary world is to acquire the capability to launch a splendid first strike against each of its nuclear armed adversaries, or at least some of them. As I said before, it's especially difficult uh, 
for a great power to achieve a splendid first strike capability against another great power, because those great powers almost always have such a large number of nuclear forces. They almost always have, or usually have, an assured destruction capability. But when you're talking about minor powers, it's a different matter. It's much easier for a great power with lots of nuclear capability, especially lots of counterforce, to establish the capability to launch a disarming first strike against a minor power. A and you want to have that capability. And that's one of the reasons that the United States will surely seek to make sure it has a splendid first strike capability against minor powers. And it'll try to have that capability against major powers, because that's the best possible outcome, given that nuclear monopoly is not on the table. I would note to you uh, uh, that some prominent scholars, uh, Mark Trachtenberg among them, maintain that the United States had a splendid first strike capability during the Cold War from the early 1950s up until about 1962. This is really quite interesting. A number of prominent scholars think that the United States, which was arms racing like crazy at the strategic nuclear level during the Cold War, had a splendid first strike capability against the Soviet Union during uh, the early years of the Cold War. Uh, and I think there's reason to believe today that under certain circumstances, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, uh, the United States has the capability uh, to launch a disarming first strike against North Korea's nuclear weapons. And I think it's quite clear that in the early 2000s, we had a first strike capability against China. Uh, I point out these examples at this point just to give you a sense that these are not unrealizable goals. Uh, not realizable all the time, but they are sometimes realizable. So what I've said to you here is the first two favorable outcomes for gaining nuclear advantage or nuclear monopoly, but let's take that off the table, and then splendid first strike. The third best outcome is damage limitation capability. Uh, and I'm not talking about escalation dominance here. That's not part of my story. But I'm talking about damage limitation. And damage limitation basically says that you have a very formidable counterforce capability. And you can take out a huge chunk of the other side's retaliatory capability. Uh, but there's no doubt that there is going to be some retaliation. And the belief is that the other side is not going to be left with anything approximating an assured destruction capability. You're going to take out so much of the other side's retaliatory capability that only a handful of nuclear weapons are going to get through. right? And if you have that capability and you are desperate enough, so the argument goes, in a crisis, uh, you will use nuclear weapons, or you will at least consider using nuclear weapons, because you have a damage limitation capability. And again, just to be very clear for people who haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this, splendid first strike means that you have the ability to take out virtually the entire arsenal on the other side. Damage limitation says you can take out a huge chunk of that arsenal, but you're still going to suffer some retaliation. The least attractive, and this is the fourth strategy, uh, the least attractive first use strategy is manipulation of risk. Uh, and basically, the argument here is that if you get into a crisis uh, and you think it's essential to use nuclear weapons, let's say you believe your survival is at stake, uh, you launch a handful of nuclear weapons, you know, two, three, maybe four nuclear weapons. Uh, into a remote area, uh, of remote piece of territory uh, uh, for the, on the other side or on the ally of the other side. Uh, and the basic aim here is to throw both sides out on the slippery slope to oblivion. Uh, we all know that uh, nuclear escalation is a subject that is really hard to get your hands around. Actually, if you look at the literature on escalation, forget the nuclear escalation, the literature on escalation in international relations is really quite terrible. 
just don't have a good literature. We just don't have a really good handle on escalation. And when you talk about nuclear escalation, we just don't know much at all, because thankfully, we've never had a nuclear war. Well, that threat of escalation, married to the fact that you're just using a handful of nuclear weapons, right, the theory goes, will cause the other side the state that has not used nuclear weapons, that did not initiate nuclear weapons, to change its behavior. You will, in effect, coerce that other state into changing its behavior, because that other state will understand that you're out there on the slippery slope to oblivion, and to put it in Thomas Schelling's terms, the last clear chance to avoid nuclear Armageddon rests with them. And even if they don't understand that at first, and they use one or two or three nuclear weapons of their own, it will quickly become apparent to both sides that you're on the slippery slope. And what will happen is that you will reach some sort of agreement. What you're doing here uh, is you're basically escalating uh, for the purpose of trying to get the other side to de-escalate. That's the basic name of the game here. right? You're not using military weapons for nuclear advantage. When you talk about a splendid first strike, you're talking about taking out the other side's nuclear arsenal. When you talk about damage limitation, you're talking about taking out the other side's arsenal and limiting damage. It has, uh, uh, has similarities with the whole notion of sort of winning a military war, uh, winning a, a victory in, in, in a military sense. That's not what's going on here. Here, you're just manipulating risk. Uh, I believe that this is never uh, the strategy of choice for a great power. Uh, they don't like manipulation of risk. If a, if, a, if a great power is forced to adopt the manipulation of risk strategy, it will nevertheless go to great lengths to see if it can find a way to develop a damage limitation capability and even better to develop a first strike capability. You'd much rather have first strike capability, then damage limitation, damage limitation capability, then a manipulation of risk strategy. But sometimes you're thrown back to having a manipulation of risk strategy as the strategy of first choice because you don't have those other two strategies. But nevertheless, I believe great powers are never satisfied with manipulation of risk alone. Uh, now, let me talk a little bit about the historical record. And I've already said some words about this. There is considerable evidence, in fact, a large body of evidence from the Cold War and from the unipolar moment that great powers relentlessly pursue advantage and sometimes real it, realize it. Excuse me. That's my argument here. My argument is that great powers pursue nuclear advantage, one, and number two, they sometimes realize it. I think if you look at the historical record, it's quite clear that that argument meshes neatly with what we know about the Cold War and the unipolar moment. Uh, just based on the work of people like Keir and Darrell, uh, Keir Lieber, Darrell Press, uh, Austin Long, and uh, Brendan Green, Mark Trachtenberg, and others, uh, it's quite clear that during the Cold War, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union arms raced for nuclear advantage. Uh, uh, there's just no question about that. Uh, moreover, I think you can make the argument, uh, as Trachtenberg does, that the United States had a first strike capability throughout the 1950s and early 1960s. And if you don't believe that, they certainly had, the United States certainly had, a significant damage limitation capability in the 50s uh, and in the early 60s. And the Soviet Union, which was arms racing with the United States by the mid-1960s, had effectively eliminated, eliminated that damage limitation capability or first strike capability that the United States had. Uh, and that's why starting in the mid-1960s, many people argued that we lived in a pure mad world. 
But the fact is the United States was not happy living in that world, and the United States continued to arms race with the Soviet Union, and the United States went to great lengths to seek nuclear advantage. And one can make a quite convincing case that by the end of the Cold War, the United States had not a first strike capability against the Soviet Union, but had a significant damage limitation capability. Certainly Soviet policymakers worried that we had that capability, and when they looked out to the future, they thought the gap between us and them would only increase with the passage of time. Then comes the end of the Cold War, the unipolar moment. The United States is the only great power in the system. We are Godzilla. You would think at that point in time, especially given the fact that the Soviet Union falls apart in late 1991, that the United States would have relaxed and would not have been interested in counterforce and would not have been interested in developing a first strike capability against China and Russia, which were not great powers in the unipolar moment, but were merely major powers. Uh, but that's not what happened. The United States worked very hard uh, to develop a splendid first strike capability, and if not a splendid first strike capability, damage limitation capability against China and against Russia. And as Keir and Darrell argue, uh, by the early 2000s, the United States probably had a splendid first strike against China's retaliatory capability, whether China mobilized its forces and got them ready, or whether they didn't. Either way, they argue, we could have taken out the entire Chinese arsenal. And they argue that under certain circumstances, mainly if the Russians hadn't been able to alert their forces and start moving them, that we probably had a splendid first strike capability and certainly a damage limitation capability against Russia in the early part of the Cold War. So what I'm telling you here is if you look at the Cold War, and you look at the unipolar moment, and you look at the behavior of the United States, there is no evidence right, that we accepted the arguments of the nuclear revolutionists or we were deeply committed to arms control. We were deeply committed to arms racing. We were seeking nuclear advantage. We worked overtime to achieve nuclear advantage. We think nuclear advantage is a good thing. And certainly when you're in the business of extended deterrence, you're going to push really hard on that front. So as we move into the multipolar world, what's the evidence? The evidence that we're first beginning to see tell us. Well, it's quite clear that the United States, certainly under Donald Trump, but I would argue under who's ever in the White House, is deeply committed to arms racing at the nuclear level. If my memory is correct, President Obama was going to spend one heck of a lot of money on modernizing our strategic nuclear forces. And you can rest assured, we were going to build a lot of counterforce, whether Barack Obama was in the White House or Donald Trump was in the White House or Hillary Clinton was in the White House. It doesn't matter at all. We're addicted to counterforce. We've been long addicted to counterforce. We've been long addicted to developing a first strike capability, and that ain't going to change. And what about the Russians? As you heard on the panels this morning, the Russians are going to arms race with us. The Russians, by the way, have a GNP about the size of Italy. The idea that they can compete with us at the conventional level is out of the question. Well, when you can't compete with Uncle Sugar at the conventional level, it's pretty obvious where you're going to go. You're going to compete with Sugar at the strategic nuclear level. And the Soviets are building lots of nuclear assets. So they're going to be arms racing. And then there's the Chinese. They look, to some extent, it's hard to say for sure, because it's early in the game, like they don't want to really arms race. Well, all I would say is if they don't arms race, they're asking for big trouble. Because if they ever get in a crisis with us, they're going to be in a use them or lose them situation. And we are going to have a very itchy trigger finger because we're going to have very powerful incentives to take out their nuclear forces, because if they don't arms race with us, we're going to have a first strike capability against them for sure. And that's not a good thing. Now, I want to say a few words about the two possible counter arguments against me. Uh, one is the nuclear revolution argument, which 
I alluded to before. And this is, this is the argument that nobody's ever going to use nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have fundamentally changed the nature of international politics. Not only can you not fight a nuclear war, you cannot fight a great power war at the conventional level. It's just war between the great powers is effectively taken off the table by nuclear weapons. So it's a waste of time to arms race. And then, of course, the second argument, which I laid out before, which I want to return to, is what I call the arms controller's argument, which is that it's just dangerous. Right? It's dangerous to arms race uh, because it makes war more likely. And what we should do is just settle down into a mad world. When I was young, like most of you students, the New York Times used to regularly run editorials praising the virtues of a mad world and saying we should do everything we can to remain in a mad world. This is basically the arms controller view. And what I want to do is just lay them out and tell you why I disagree with them. Uh, the claim that no state would initiate a nuclear war, as I've said to you, is predicated on two assumptions. One is that these weapons are destructive in the extreme, which is, which is true. And two, that we don't really understand nuclear escalation, which is true. Uh, so the assumptions on which the theory uh, is based is, 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 is correct. And the argument is if you're in a world where both sides have assured destruction capabilities, you know, this is the United States and the Soviet Union from 65 up to, let's say, 85 then it just makes absolutely no sense to even think about nuclear use. Uh, but some nuclear revolutionists argue that even with just a small number of nuclear weapons, just a small number of nuclear weapons, even if you don't have an assured destruction capability, you still won't have a war. This is the existential deterrence argument, which is usually attached to McGeorge Bundy's name. And his argument is that, you know, this, the terrible and avoidable uncertainties in any recourse to nuclear war create what could be called existential deterrence, where the function of the adjective, and he, of course, is talking about existential, is to distinguish this phenomenon from anything based on strategic theories or declared policies or even international commitments. His point is that if you have countries that have nuclear weapons. To talk about fighting a nuclear war with a country, even one that doesn't have an assured destruction capability, even one that just has a rather small retaliatory force, is out of the question. Any recourse to war makes no sense at all. And similarly, as many of you know, there's a whole school of thought out there that talks about the nuclear taboo. The nuclear taboo is very similar to the Bundy argument about existential deterrence, and it's part of a theory, a body of theory associated with the nuclear revolution. Look, I want to be very clear here. I believe that the case for the nuclear revolution is a powerful one. I would never dismiss it. If I had to defend it in a debate, I could do a very good job defending it. But nevertheless, it's wrong. Uh, <laughs> As emphasized in my earlier comments, there are sound strategic reasons for pursuing nuclear advantage, which is another way of saying there are circumstances under which a great power might initiate nuclear war. Moreover, there is an abundance of evidence which shows that states seek nuclear advantage because they think they might have to fight a nuclear war. I mean, you just want to ask yourself, why do we have this huge body of evidence that shows that the United States and the Soviet Union were seeking nuclear advantage? Why is that the case? Why do we see evidence that during the unipolar moment, the United States was working to make sure that it had a splendid first strike capability against China and Russia? It's because we thought it was in our advantage. Those people didn't believe in the nuclear revolution. And I think they didn't believe in the nuclear revolution for good reason. And again, I don't want to poo-poo the nuclear revolution argument, because again, it is a powerful argument. I often make the same point about isolationism. I can make a very powerful case for isolationism as a grand strategy for the United States. I'm not, N-O-T, 
and isolationist. But the case for isolationism is very powerful and you want to understand it. The case for the nuclear re revolution is very powerful and you want to understand it. But it's wrong. There's a logic that shows you why it's wrong, which I've tried to lay out here, and the evidence cuts against it in very significant ways. Uh, now, I want to make a couple points just about what the world will look like uh, going forward uh, and why it's reasonable to think that there will be uh, uh, some possibility of nuclear use. I think given that we've never had nuclear weapons used since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is a wonderful thing, right? it's hard for a lot of people to think that it's possible uh, that nuclear war would ever happen. By the way, one of the best ways to sort of illustrate the fallacy of that argument that you know, nuclear weapons would never be used is just to ask a person, if we were to run the Cold War a hundred more times, we ran it once and we had no nuclear war. If we were to run it a hundred times, do you think that we would have 100 cases where there was no nuclear war? I've asked lots of people this question, and almost everybody thinks that if we ran it 100 times, uh, that at least five or six or seven times we would have had a nuclear war. That tells you something. Nuclear war is not impossible. Thankfully, we dodged the bullet the one and only time we ran it. But you don't want to bet that if we had to run it again, it wouldn't end up. Uh, with nuclear weapons being used. But I want to talk about the future of the, for the, the coming multipolar world. Uh, why do I think that there is a possibility that there'll be nuclear use? Uh, first, uh, I think there's good reason to think that the United States has or is going to have a splendid first strike capability or significant damage limitation capability against small nuclear powers like North Korea. And I think you can imagine scenarios where we end up using nuclear weapons against North Korea. Likely, no. Possible, yes. But maybe even great powers like China or Russia. Uh, if the Chinese don't arms race with us, uh, they're going to put themselves in a vulnerable position. And you can rest assured that the United States is moving full speed ahead to develop lots of sophisticated counterforce for either damage limiting or war fighting purposes. Um, second, and very importantly, when you look at what a possible war between China and the United States look like, uh, it becomes clear that they could end up fighting a limited war over control of the East China Sea or the South China Sea and the islands in those large bodies of water. Uh, or they could end up fighting a war over another island called Taiwan. And these wars, especially the wars over the East China Sea and the South China Sea, would be fought in good part in large bodies of water, and they would not involve ground forces fighting on the Chinese mainland. And I think in that geographical space, it's conceivable to come up with, or it's possible to come up with plausible scenarios where nuclear weapons are used because the collateral damage would not be great and you would think that you could keep things limited. Uh, this situation stands in marked contrast to the situation we faced in the Cold War. Uh, when we ran war games involving the United States and the Soviet Union in the Cold War, everything quickly devolved to the Central Front. We had this thing called the swing strategy. We would swing forces out of East Asia to the Central Front. The center the central front was the center of the universe. Yet when we ran war games, it was almost impossible to get a war started in Central Europe. And the reason was you had two massive armies, eyeball to eyeball, each armed to the teeth with thousands of nuclear weapons. Who in God's name was going to start a war on either the Soviet side or the American side? The chances that this would lead to nuclear Armageddon were pretty significant. And given those consequences, you know, it's very hard to get a war started between the United States and the Soviet Union. You start think about, thinking about the United States and the Chinese tangling in the South China Sea, much easier to imagine a war getting started. And then, of course, there's another nuclear danger uh, 
um, in a war between China and the United States that I haven't talked about. And this is the threat of inadvertent escalation, which Caitlin Talmadge has worked on and uh, people talked about this morning. Uh, the fact is that the Pentagon appears to have plans to launch massive strikes against the t Chinese mainland in a war over Taiwan. And it is the case that Chinese nuclear and conventional assets are largely indistinguishable and uh, they're co-located in many cases. And the end result is that as we fight this conventional war, uh, we may begin to erode or chip away at the Chinese nuclear arsenal. And that may give them cause to use nuclear weapons to tell us to cease and desist. I would argue that even if we don't chip away at their nuclear arsenal, we're able to avoid hitting their nuclear arsenal. If you start to launch massive air raids and naval attacks against the Chinese mainland, I think there's a very good chance that they would retaliate with nuclear weapons. Uh, one thing that strikes me from having studied great power politics for decades and decades is how sensitive, how paranoid great powers are about their security, and especially when it comes to their homeland. When you run the NATO alliance right up to Russia's border, you're really asking for trouble. You get into a war with China and you start to launch massive attacks against the Chinese mainland, uh, I don't think they're going to sit there and take that. Uh, I think they're going to think long and hard about how to retaliate. And there are going to be at least a few people who are thinking about using nuclear weapons. If I were in Beijing, I'd certainly be thinking about using nuclear weapons. Uh, third reason we don't want to be too optimistic is that the U.S. remains deeply committed to extended deterrence. As long as we're deeply committed to extended deterrence, right? The need to use nuclear weapons is always there. Uh, some of you may say, oh, what we should do is eliminate all this emphasis on extended deterrence. Uh, I would say to you who advocate that, then get ready for a lot more proliferation. And then finally, to return to a point I made earlier, the Russians clearly are emphasizing nuclear weapons uh, in their defense buildup. Uh, they are deeply fearful of the United States. You listen to people talk about the Russians. The Russians are really scared of the United States. We're in their face. We're in their face. They know we're building all this counterforce damage limiting. You can't fool them any more than you can fool the Chinese. Tell the Chinese to pivot to Asia is really not designed to contain them. They laugh in your face, appropriately so. The Russians understand we're right in their face. They understand we're building all this counterforce. They're scared. Again, my study of great power behavior over time tells me when you scare a great power, you're really asking for big trouble. And you're really asking for big trouble when that country has nuclear weapons and doesn't think it can deal with you at the conventional level. I want to make a final point. It's a general point about deterrence for those of you who think nuclear war will never happen. When we focus on deterrence, we teach classes on deterrence, which is especially true of nuclear deterrence when I was young. Uh, we tend to focus on the military variable. What are the costs and benefits of using military force? Can we do this? Can we do that? You know, if we launch the Schlieffen plan, will it work? If we do this, will it work or not work? How costly will it be? When you look at deterrence, you not only have to look at the military variable, you have to look at the political variable. Because countries go to war for political reasons. They're powerful political reasons that push countries to war. And then the question is, do the military capabilities, when you look at the balance of power between the attacker and the defender, do the military capabilities of the two sides allow you, the aggressor, to think that you can achieve your success? Okay? We have two very famous cases in the historical record where countries went to war thinking they were going to lose. But they went to war because they thought that the status quo, the political status quo, was completely unacceptable. And therefore, they were willing to take a leap in the dark. In both cases, and I'll lay them out for you in a second, in both cases, they thought there was 
some small chance they would succeed, they would win. But they thought in all likelihood they would lose. But nevertheless, they went to war because the value of peace, continued peace, was so low. The incentives to go. And the two cases are the Egyptians in 1973 when they attacked the Israelis and the Japanese in 1941 when they attacked the United States at Pearl Harbor. The Egyptians in 1973 had no illusions that this was really a case of Bambi going up against Godzilla and the Egyptians were not Godzilla, they were Bambi, right? One of the reasons the Israelis got caught with their pants down in 1973 and even when the Israelis finally figured out the Egyptians were coming, were slow to mobilize the IDF, the ground forces, was because the IDF couldn't believe, the Israelis leaders couldn't believe that the Egyptians would attack because the balance of power was so unfavorable to them. The reason the Egyptians attacked was they were desperate. Right? And the same thing is true with regard to Pearl Harbor. Bruce Russett, Scott Sagan, and others have written on this. I used to think when I was young that the Japanese were irrational, but they show you they were not irrational. The value of peace was so low, they were willing to leap into the dark. Okay? I only raise these two examples to tell you that there could be cases in the future where countries that are armed with nuclear weapons are desperately scared. You say to yourself, but why should they be scared, John? They have nuclear weapons. They're the ultimate deterrent. You know, it's funny. I would think that that's the way they would think, but they don't think that way. It's interesting, you go to a place like Israel, you talk to the leaders there, people in the national security community, how about how they think about their security. They do not have a profound sense that we have nuclear weapons, we have the ultimate deterrent, therefore we don't really have to worry very much about our survival. You go to Moscow today, you talk to Putin and his lieutenants, right? What you discover is that they are scared I say to them, what are you scared? You've got nuclear weapons. I've never seen a country on the planet that has nuclear weapons that disappeared. They don't want to hear that argument, right? They're scared. So you get a country like Russia that's really scared and you get in their face and you start threatening them, don't be surprised if this is Pearl Harbor or the Yom Kippur War all over. Okay, let me uh, conclude uh, by talking a little bit about arms control. Uh, one might think that uh, arms control is a means to seriously limit nuclear arms racing. It isn't. Uh, I'm not opposed to arms control in all honesty, but it's not likely to curb nuclear arms racing in any meaningful way. The first reason is that arms control agreements by and large, uh, involve the weapons that great powers are really not interested in developing anyway. Uh, they don't place a high premium on them. Any weapon that, an, that a great power thinks will give it nuclear advantage is not going to be the subject of an arms control agreement. Second point I would make to you, and it's related, is that arms control agreements work in some cases to facilitate arms racing. They work to facilitate arms racing. And first of all, they can do that by freeing up resources, right? If, if you have a SALT-1 agreement, you don't spend money on ballistic missile defense. That's wonderful, in my opinion, because ballistic missile defense is a really classic case of throwing uh, money down a rat hole, right? You don't spend that money on ballistic missile defense. You can spend it on counterforce weapons. But the other way that arms control facilitates arms racing is that when hawks want to build a particular system, in some cases they can't do it. Right? They can't do it because there's political opposition in their own country. And what arms control does is it allows the hawks to say that the quid pro quo for going along with arms control is to allow the Pentagon to build those counterforce systems. And I know this from personal experience. Kira alluded to the fact that I was in the Air Force from 1970 to 72. Uh, most of you in the audience are too young to remember what um, Sentiment 
towards military things were like in this country in the wake of the Vietnam War. Uh, or this wasn't even the wake of the Vietnam War, it was at the end of the Vietnam War, 70 to 72. Uh, the Senate had basically forced the Air Force to lock up all its counterforce systems. Hard to believe. I remember Senator Edward Brooke, who was a Republican from Massachusetts, played the key role in forcing the Pentagon to slow down greatly its development of counterforce weaponry. What the administration did, this is the Nixon administration, the Pentagon in particular, the War Hawks, is they said the quid pro quo for going along with SALT-1 is you unlock the counterforce weapons that are in the closet. You have to unlock them. So the Pentagon went along with SALT-1, and the end result was the counterforce weapons were unleashed. And I was talking to John Maurer, who has a PhD from here at Georgetown, who's done work on the early arms control agreements, including SALT-1, and he was telling me, make sure you read his book when it comes out, right? He was telling me that the hawks in the Nixon administration were deeply committed to arms control because they want to put, they wanted to put quantitative limits on our ability to build missiles so that they could arms race at the qualitative level, which is counterforce. In other words, they didn't want more launchers, more ballistic missiles. They wanted more warheads and more accurate warheads. They wanted more counterforce capability. So he was telling me that, and this is consistent with my story, some of the biggest hawks in the Nixon administration were in favor of arms control because they saw it as a way to arms race for the purposes of gaining nuclear advantage. My third point to you is that arms control agreements are going to be much tougher to negotiate in multipolarity than they were in bipolarity because you have three players instead of two players. And getting three players together to agree is much more difficult than just two players. And I think a harbinger of trouble on this front um, can be seen in the recent discussions about the INF Treaty. Uh, the INF Treaty, as you know, was consummated in the mid-1980s, 1987. It involved just the United States and the Soviet Union, and today it involves just the United States and Russia. But the end result of this is that the Chinese are free to build all of the intermediate range missiles they want, nuclear or conventional. And the United States and the Russians can't do this. I believe personally that the main reason the Americans want out of INF is not because of the Russians and the fact that the Russians are cheating. I think we want out because of what's going on in Asia. The idea that the Chinese are going to be free to build INF and we can't build them, not going to happen. And I believe the Russians are thinking to some extent in the same way. Well, what's the obvious solution to this? The obvious solution is to go to the Chinese and say, join the INF. We tried that. You know what the Chinese said? Take a hike. The Chinese, shock. I know this is shocking. The Chinese like their INF, right? Can you blame them? If I'm in Beijing playing their hand, I like INF too. I'm not going to sign some stupid treaty, right? It was not a stupid treaty for the Americans and the Russians to sign in the mid-1980s. It was a very smart treaty. I'm not knocking the INF. The point I'm making to you is that you move into a multipolar world, you have three players, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans. And I think at this point in time, it is pretty much the Chinese and the Russians against the Americans. It kind of looks bipolarish, But the fact is, the Russians have their eye on the Chinese. The Chinese make them very nervous. Talk about one belt, one road into Central Asia, the Russians' hands start shaking, right? So, you know, you have three players here, three players thinking about INF. And we're not talking about an arms race involving China, Russia, and the United States uh, that's restricted to INF. Um, the arms racing that's coming down the road will involve much more than just intermediate range nuclear weapons. And it will be an intense competition. In some, great power politics has returned. And as we know from the Cold War, matters of nuclear strategy and matters of arms racing will be front and center for both practitioners and students of international politics. Thank you.
to take some questions? Sure, I'll, I'll take some, gladly take some questions. Sir, there's somebody right dead center there. You should just talk, do they have a microphone? Oh yeah, there's a microphone. Um, sir, in 1994, you were very vocal about uh, Ukraine surrendering its nuclear arsenal to Russia. Um, and I just wanted to know, in your opinion, is the annexation of Crimea a vindication of your opposition to Ukraine <laughs> surrendering its nuclear weapons? Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote a piece, for those of you who don't, who don't know, uh, in 1993, arguing that Ukraine should not give up its nuclear weapons because one day the Russians would come knocking and they would have good use uh, for their nuclear weapons. So the gentleman's question is, given that the Russians uh, conquered or annexed Crimea uh, in 2014, uh, would that not be the case if they had nuclear weapons? Uh, and would I uh, therefore be vindicated? <laughs> I'm tempted to say, of course. Uh, but I don't think the answer is, of course. Uh, I don't think uh, that uh, Ukrainian, if, if Ukraine had kept its nuclear weapons and, and had a formidable nuclear deterrent, I do not believe uh, that it would have stopped Russia from taking Ukraine. And I don't believe that Ukraine would have used nuclear weapons to prevent it from happening. I do think, and I can't prove this, this is just my intuition, uh, I do think that it would have gone a long way towards keeping the Russians out of eastern Ukraine. Uh, I think that uh, if Ukraine had nuclear weapons and had started to threaten to use them, uh, if the Russians intervened in eastern Ukraine, that there's a good chance that that would have worked. Uh, but one can never be 100% certain. I mean, one of the problems here, and this is a point that I it's related to a point that I tried to drive home here. You can never be certain that nuclear weapons won't be used. Right? This is my problem with the nuclear revolution argument. You can never be certain that they won't be used. You also can't be certain that they will be used. Because again, they are weapons of mass destruction. And countries don't use these weapons lightly. And also, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, because of the geographical proximity, it's much more difficult for Ukrainians to think about lobbying nuclear weapons into Western Russia when you think about all the consequences regarding fallout and so forth and so on. So uh, I think it would have been good for Ukraine if it had those nuclear weapons, but not for purposes of keeping Crimea. Sir, uh, ma'am. Okay, uh, I'll repeat the question, and please correct me if I don't get it exactly right. Her, her question is that uh, the North Koreans uh, would like significant uh, relief from the sanctions that we have on them, and in return they will dismantle significant parts of their nuclear inventory. And she asked me what my advice would be to, um, to President Trump on how to deal with the North Koreans. My view is the North Koreans would be crazy to give up their nuclear weapons, right? I'm not talking about from an American point of view. I think whenever you think about nuclear weapons, you want to think about what's in America's interest and then what's in the interest of the other country. For example, if I were an Iranian national security advisor, Iran would already have nuclear weapons. Right? This is not in America's interest. Right? It's not in America's interest, I want to be clear. It's not in America's interest for North Korea to have nuclear weapons. It is in North Korea's interest to have nuclear weapons. 
right? I remember Ehud Barak, former Israeli prime minister, said about Iran, he said, the reason to think that Iran is pursuing nuclear weapons is because it makes so much sense. <laughs> Just think about that statement. He, of course, is correct, right? But anyway, so my view is they're not going to give them up. And this is all just one giant waste of time. And uh, I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, I, I think that it is important for the United States to be very careful with the North Koreans. Because again, as I've emphasized here, if the North Koreans get really scared, they could use a nuclear weapon. Again, not likely, but they could. And given the consequences, I don't want to see that happen. But the other thing that you have to remember about the North Korean case, and it's what really distinguishes it from the Iran case, is that North Korea has a benefactor. There are just real limits to how rough we can get with the North Koreans, because the Chinese don't want us getting rough with the North Koreans. Remember, when we crossed the 38th parallel in the fall of 1950, it was the Chinese who came in. And when we fought the Korean War from 1950 to 1953, we were not fighting the North Koreans. It was the Americans against the Chinese. The Chinese made it manifestly clear in 1950 to 53, that North Korea is of huge strategic importance to them. And I believe if the North Korean regime, for example, were to implode tomorrow, the Chinese would be in there like that. The last thing they want to happen is to have a unified Korea under South Korean auspices, which means the Americans are up on the Yalu River, right? But just with regard to nuclear weapons, it's very tough for us to get tough. It's very tough for us to get tough with North Korea because if we threaten to bring the regime down, that automatically triggers Chinese intervention. In the case of Iran, if we are able, and I don't think we'll pull this off, but if we're able to bring the Iranians to their knees, at this point in time, there's nobody who will come to Iran's rescue. So I think this is a hopeless situation, and we just have to live with the fact that China, excuse me, that North Korea is going to have nuclear weapons for the foreseeable future and do everything we can to make sure we don't have a nuclear war. Sir. Thanks very much, Professor Mearsheimer. One quick question. Just given China's relatively small nuclear arsenal, at least at present, do you think they ascribe to the manipulation of risk? strategy? Uh, I think that they have to subscribe to a manipulation of risk strategy. I mean, here's what you want to think about. You want to think about how you can use nuclear weapons. This is the thorniest issue. I, 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 gave, I, I actually wrote my talk out and I gave the paper to a couple young friends of mine and they, their view was, John, nobody's ever going to use nuclear weapons, right? It's just not going to happen. That told me it was incumbent upon me to make a case that there are scenarios where they can be used, okay? So the question you have to ask yourself is, how can you use these things, not only in ways that give you military advantage, but also so that you don't get vaporized? You understand what I'm saying? You don't want to get vaporized. It's not a good thing. Right? And, and, and when you're dealing with nuclear weapons, that possibility is always out there, okay? Now, nuclear first strike, splendid first strike, that's one possibility. Not possible for the Chinese. Damage limitation, not possible. I mean, they're dealing with the United States of America, you know, which has got you know, a huge number of warheads. Just not going to happen. They can't do first strike. They can't do damage limitation. I, I don't believe in escalation dominance and haven't talked about it, but they can't do escalation dominance either. They're left with nothing but manipulation of risk. You know, what else are they going to do? And I, I just say to you, if you're the United States of America and you think there's a really good chance that you have either a splendid first strike capability or a damage limitation capability against China. You get into a conflict, say over the East China Sea, and for some reason you decide it's appropriate to use nuclear weapons. 
I think that the Americans, even if they think there's a really good chance they have damage limitation or first strike capabilities, will first go to manipulation of risk because it only involves a handful of nuclear weapons, right? And I think, you know, the fear of escalation, right, uh, may be so great that, you know, you don't want to just really uh, go full blast. I'm not saying that's true, but I think in the Chinese case, they really just, they have no choice. Sir. Do you think in the long run that investments in China, uh, as much as investments in um, upgrading its nuclear arsenal will help compensate for the structural weaknesses and its conventional capabilities? His question was wh whether or not I think that Russia investing such great resources at the nuclear level will compensate in smart ways or effective ways for the fact that it's not invested as much money in uh, conventional forces, because they're robbing Peter to pay Paul, that kind of argument. Uh, I think the answer is yes. I mean, I think if you're playing their hand, that's the smart thing to do. Uh, I, I was in, uh, at the Valdai conference in Russia uh, two years ago and talked to all sorts of uh, Russian leaders. Um, and uh, the Russians don't want an arms race with the United States. Uh, the Russians are well aware that one of the key factors that wrecked the Soviet Union was spending all that money on defense. They understand that their economy is basically a giant gas station and that what they have to do is modernize the economy. And they understand that spending lots of money on defense is not the way to do that. And one of the reasons they would like to spend money on nuclear is it, uh, nuclear weapons is because of the more bang for the buck rationale that the Eisenhower administration laid out in the 50s. Most of you are too young to remember this, but there was a time in the 1950s, George Humphreys was the Secretary of the Treasury, when Republicans actually believed, really believed in a balanced budget. And they thought that Harry Truman had spent out the gazoo and it was crazy they were spending all this money on defense. So the Republicans came to power and they wanted to get more bang for the buck. And what they did was they spent more money on nuclear weapons and really downgraded spending on conventional forces. You could argue that the strategic circumstances were such in the 50s that that made good strategic sense as well. And you can argue in the Russian case today that it makes good strategic sense to rely on nuclear over conventional. And it also makes good economic sense because then you can limit how much money you spend on defense and hopefully do things to refurbish your economy. I think either way, the, Rus the Russians are in real trouble. This is a declining great power over the long term. The real threat for the United States is China. Last question. Last question, sorry. Somebody back there has their hand up. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Mearsheimer. Um, so I guess we should consider um, how a minor power that has not yet gone nuclear might look at the situation in Ukraine and the results thereof, going back to the first question, and I feel this is very timely because, turns out, President Nursultan Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan has just resigned. So we don't know what the next leadership will look like. We don't know how they'll be thinking. You've talked about how we don't know how future leaders of foreign powers will think. If you're Kazakhstan, what has to go right or go wrong for you to consider building up a nuclear arsenal, maybe something very minor, type four, and what would the implications of that be for great power politics in the region? Uh, I don't know much about Kazakhstan. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Kazakhstan, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, as many of you know, four countries ended up with nuclear weapons on their territory, uh, not necessarily under their control. Uh, most people believe the Russians maintain control, but there's no question that Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine all ended up with nuclear weapons on their territory. And the Kazakhs gave it up uh, pretty easily. Uh, my, my sense is that Kazakhstan doesn't face any great threats, and therefore there's no real incentive to acquire nuclear weapons. It's not easy to acquire nuclear weapons. They're expensive, and furthermore, the Russians will go to great lengths to make sure they don't uh, 
develop nuclear weapons, and we, of course, will as well. I believe the Russians and the Amer this is one issue the Russians and the Americans and probably the Chinese will work together on. So I don't think that's the problem. I think if you look out at the nuclear proliferation front today, uh, the scenario you want to keep your eye on is Iran, Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, the United States, as you know, has walked away from the JCPOA, and if the Iranians walk away from the JCPOA and they start to enrich uranium, uh, the uh, Saudis have made it clear that they're going to enrich uranium. And if the Iranians begin to get a bomb because they act the way Ehud Barak and John Mearsheimer think they should, right, and they start moving down that road, the Saudis will be right behind them. And then if you begin to look around the region, you start thinking about the Turks, you start thinking about the Iraqis, you start thinking about the Egyptians. You think they're going to be happy with a situation where Iran and Saudi Arabia are getting nuclear weapons and they don't have them? I don't think so. Uh, this is one of the reasons I think walking away from the JCPOA was a really stupid thing to do. I mean, the administration is betting that they can bring the, uh, uh, the Iranians to their knees and take this problem off the table forever. Uh, that may happen. Who's to say it won't for sure? But I would not bet a lot of money on that. And I'd bet my money that the Iranians will eventually develop nuclear weapons or certainly get back into the business of enriching. And once they get into the business of enriching and the Saudis follow suit, dot, dot, dot. But uh, that, that's the scenario I keep my eye on today. Uh, I wouldn't worry uh, much about Kazakhstan. And, I think, fortunately, from our point of view, uh, extended deterrence appears to be working reasonably well, uh, despite all of President Trump's efforts to, you know, do serious damage, apropos Charlie's comments this morning, uh, to uh, the alliances in both Europe and especially in Asia. Uh, but as long as we're able to keep, you know, those alliances intact, uh, an extended deterrence remains. Uh, a viable idea. Those countries don't have an incentive to get nuclear weapons. But, uh, but if, if extended deterrence falls apart and Iran begins to enrich, boy, you're opening Pandora's box. Uh, and it won't be Kazakhstan. Thank you. Please join me in thanking John.